Addiction is a chronic disease. Millions of people worldwide suffer from substance and behavioral addictions. An addict's life is often unmanageable, leaving the addict and his or her family and friends feeling completely powerless over the disease. Without treatment, addiction can result in disability or premature death. You are listening to Making an Addict. My name is DJ Burr, and I'm an addict in long-term recovery. I'm a licensed psychotherapist, behavioral addiction specialist, and best-selling author of I Just Wanted Love, Recovery of a Codependent Sex and Love Addict, now available on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes. I intend to bring you different perspectives about addiction from various sources, including other addicts in recovery, clinicians who treat recovering addicts, and family and friends of addicts to discover what makes an addict. Listener discretion is advised. To learn more about this podcast, check us out at makinganaddict.com or follow me on social media at djburr1022 on Facebook, the DJ Burr on Instagram, and at djburr1022 on Twitter. Welcome to another episode of Making an Addict. I am DJ Burr, and today we are talking with Mitch Russo. Mitch is joining us uh, to talk about his experience of growing up in New York City and getting sucked into the drug culture and what it was like for him to, to fight back and become a successful business owner. Mitch, welcome to the show. Thanks, DJ. Great to be here with you. Yeah, your story sounds fascinating. I'm glad that you had time to, to come in and, and talk with me. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Yeah. So the show is called Making an Addict. And what we focus on is talking to people about their experiences, whether they're an addict who's in recovery or not in recovery or a professional who treats uh, folks in recovery. So can you tell our audience more about you and your story? Sure. Sure. So I would uh, I would be in the category of having been an addict and have fully recovered uh, since my initial drug use and experience. And I'll give you some background. Uh, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and I um, I was raised in what I would call a middle-class family environment. I was raised in a nice home by good parents, and um, basically, I was the type of a kid who who was curious and liked to get into things. And um, when I was uh, 14 years old, my parents filed for divorce and sort of left my sister and I uh, a little bit confused and a little bit bewildered. We didn't know what had happened or why it had happened, and uh, we had a lot of emotional issues to deal with all of a sudden. Well, I mean, at that age, I was just 15 years old, um, I started a rock band, and that rock band became super popular, and, you know, it was a high school rock band, and and uh you know along with that life uh came a lot of a lot of drugs and for me it started just about the way it starts with everybody we smoke in pot uh and then um after that became familiar um we started experimenting with all different types of drugs and i mean anything i mean we would smoke anything we would swallow almost anything back then we were stupid kids so if uh, if some pills came along and someone told us they were good, we'd just swallow them and take them. Uh, and I know, I, I mean, I, it's amazing uh, how stupid we were, but that's, <laughs> that's, that's what we did. And I avoided heroin for quite a while. Um, I knew what it was, of course, and I knew what the results would be of getting involved with it. But, uh, but I did get involved with it. And what happened is that um, one day I was looking to get high and um, I didn't have anybody I could get some pot from, so this guy offered me some smack and offered it for free. So I said, sure, and basically at that point, he did all the work. He, you know, he cooked up the dope in the spoon. He, um, he brought it up into the needle and put it in my arm, and, and that was my first time using heroin. And that was in the bathroom of high school. So it was, uh, it was, uh, I'll never forget, it was a cold, cold day. It was a winter day, and the windows were in the bathroom were open because everybody else was smoking all kinds of stuff in there. Uh, we always kept the windows open, smoking cigarettes, smoking dope, smoking hash, whatever. 
And here I was, I, I didn't feel any cold at all. I just basically sunk to the floor and sat there. Uh, and I must have sat there, I, I guess I sat there for about 45 minutes. And I finally got up and I started walking to my first class. And I just turned around and, and emptied the contents of my stomach. And uh, that I found out was soon to become a very familiar feeling, that feeling of nausea and then purging. So uh, at the time, um, when that first happened, I was a little concerned, and, and everyone said, oh, don't worry about it. That happens all the time. So I stopped being concerned about it. But, you know, I resisted it, but I couldn't stay away. And I kept going back. And uh, there was a point in time when, um, you know, we had the band, and the, the band was doing fantastic. One of the rules that I had set aside for the band members is that if we're going to practice or we're going to play outdoor, play play a gig, there's no getting high. And the reason I did that is because when we got high and we practiced, it, everything sounded terrible. So <laughs> it, we we just figured, you know, and and the only way to know that, of course, is to turn on the tape recorder. And once we played the tape back and said, "Wow, that really does suck." Uh, so we we just decided that we weren't going to get high. And it was like a Friday afternoon, and I had bought a bag of dope. And I put it in my wallet, and the next morning was band practice. So we all assembled in my basement. In my basement, um, you know, talk about parents. If there's parents listening to this show, let me just tell you something, parents. There are signals that you missed and you didn't see that your kids are telling you what's going on. And for me, uh, we weren't shy about it at all. We were painting hypodermic needles on the walls with bags of dope and spoons with flames under them, but all using day glow paint. So if you didn't turn on the black light, you couldn't see a thing. <laughs> but if you turned on the black light, there it was uh, in all its glory, if you will. So there's a, there's always hints. You know, that's what I was going to say. But So I come home this day, and we go through band practice, and everybody leaves the house. And I sit down. I've been thinking about that bag of dope in my wallet just about the entire time we were practicing. And I pull it out of my wallet, and I grab my little kit and my spoon and my matchbook uh, with the tilted back cover so I could tilt the match up, and my little ball of cotton. And I, and I prepare this mixture, and I put it in the spoon, and I, it bubbles up. I draw it up into the syringe, and... DJ, the craziest thing happened at that moment in time. The phone rang, and it was a little unusual for the phone to ring on a Saturday morning. Well, now it rings constantly with telemarketers, but oh sure, <laughs> right. So, but back then, I uh, I put the needle down, I picked up the phone, and I said hello, and there was no answer. I just heard some clicking, so I kept saying hello, hello, who's calling? Can you hear me? Hello. This must have gone on for ten or fifteen seconds until finally I got frustrated and I hung the phone back up. Then I picked up the needle to resume what I was doing, which was just about to plunge it into my arm. And the amazing thing happened, the thing that changed my life forever happened, the needle gelled solid. So if that phone call would not have come at that exact second, I would have plunged that needle into my arm and injected a hot chemical substance that would have gelled instantly as soon as it reached my heart. Oh, I would have man. been dead in approximately 30 seconds. So I ask you this, DJ, who did I get that phone call from? Exactly. Right? Yeah. And I, I basically, at that point, I broke down crying. I broke down and I, I sobbed and I sobbed all alone in my basement. And I, I realized the bullet that I had just missed. And I realized that, that the next one is waiting for me if I don't stop this type of behavior. And I vowed that I was no longer going to be doing heroin ever again. And that summer, my mom had offered me something which I had turned down at first, but I, after this experience, I took her up on it. She said, how would you like to go up to the uh, Catskills in New York State and work in the summer camp. And uh, at first I said no, 
But after this happened, I went back to her and I said, Mom, is that offer still open? And she said, yeah, I think it is. I'll call and get the arrangements. And so I went away to summer camp knowing that I wouldn't have access uh, to any kind of, any heroin anyway, certainly no smack. And um, for the most part, I was clean the entire summer of heroin. I still had all the other crap I was doing. I was smoking a lot of pot still. Uh, but here's what happened, and this is, I think, uh, part of how life works. Um, you know, I I got to be known in camp as the head waiter, uh, and I think that's a pun if you get it. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I was a, a guy that you can go to if you wanted to get stoned because I always had bags of pot with me and all kinds of goodies. And so it was a Sunday afternoon in August, and... Um, a guy comes up to me and says, hey, have you ever tried to eat hash? And I said, no, I've smoked it, but I've never tried to eat it. And he said, oh, you got to try it. It's amazing. I said, oh, okay. And he hands me a ball of hash, probably the circumference of a quarter. And I just pop it in my mouth and I swallow it. And it's probably about uh, four o'clock in the afternoon when I did that. About an hour later, there's an announcement over the PA system at camp. It says, uh, Mitch Russo, Mitch Russo, please come to the counselor shack. And I do, and there's the manager of the camp waiting for me. And he said, uh, okay, get your jacket. Um, your mom wants you home right now. And I said, what? It's Sunday afternoon, and I'm in camp. What are you talking about? And he said, and he said look, uh, I'm just here. <laughs> you know, your mom says put him on a bus and get him home. I'm just doing what your mom wants me to do. I said, well, I I could do it tomorrow morning. I don't have to do it tonight. And he said, nope, she said tonight. So at this point, I had no idea what was going on. I had a feeling it had something to to do with my my grandfather's passing away. He had passed away the week previously. Okay. Uh, But but I didn't understand what was happening. Uh, And it took about an hour to get mobilized and get my stuff and get a drive over to the bus station. And I sat in the bus station and I waited and nothing was happening. I wasn't feeling high or I was just feeling worried, like what was going on. And the bus finally came and I got on the bus and it's a four hour ride from the Catskills back to Brooklyn, New York, where I lived. And I'm on the bus and I don't feel anything at all. And I'm thinking probably better that I don't knowing what's coming. Uh, and so the bus arrives uh, in New York City. I stand up and I fall back down. Uh, oh. So it had hit me like a brick wall and I was spinning and I was my smashed out of my face. But I finally got up and I made my way off the bus and waiting for me was my older brother and my cousin. And uh, they saw me and they laughed. They said, oh, man, are you in for it? And I said, what's going on? What's going on? And they wouldn't tell me. And so I sat in the car as we drove back to my house, and it was like probably a 45-minute ride because the the station, I think it was one of the New York City, maybe Penn Station. So I opened up the door, and my mother's standing there. She takes one look at me, and she starts screaming, Milton, Milton, look, he's on it right now. He's on it now. Of course, it was pretty Obvious, I was wrecked. I was stoned out of my head. And she uh, got all excited and started to cry. And Milton said, come on in, son. And so he, they walked me downstairs to where I told you the, uh, the band room was in the basement. Right. And uh, there standing downstairs is my uncle from Florida. Now, my uncle had been up during the week for the funeral. And while he was there, um, his own son had problems with drugs, and he knew the drug mentality. So he started poking around my band room. He flipped on the ultraviolet lights. He saw the paintings. He then went feeling around inside the ceiling beams and found my little steel stash box, uh, of one, of, one of many. So when I went downstairs, I was led downstairs by my mom, and I took a look, and you know, my little band room was right next to the washer dryer. And on top of the washer and dryer, there was a towel, and everything inside my little stash box was sort of laid out, 
with little labels like Exhibit A and Exhibit B. And uh, I, at that point, you know, I was caught. I mean, there was nothing I could do. Um, and so I, uh, I ended up at this point just saying, yep, that's, that's, I don't, but I did say, I said, look, I don't do that anymore. That's when I was doing heroin and I don't do that anymore. And my, my mother said to me, look, I understand. Look, you're just too stoned. Go to sleep and we'll talk about it in the morning, which, hey, I was thrilled to do that. So I, I woke up the next morning and, and she's much calmer at that point and I'm no longer stoned. And she says, listen, you know, we love you and this is a problem and we got to get you some help. So I'm going to uh, make an appointment with a doctor, uh, but you can't go out of the house for the next few days until the doctor's appointment. And as I told you, it's mid-August. I mean, all my friends are around, and and I I just wanted to hang out. And meanwhile, I'm stuck in the house. And, of course, I invite some friends over, and I have other stashes, so we got high in the closet and all that. But come Wednesday, um, my mom tells me to get in the car. We drive into Manhattan. And I said, well, who are we going to see? And she says, well, the doctor's name is Dr. Dan Casriel. And he has an institute in New York City called Ariba, A-R-E-B-A. And it stands for Accelerated Rehabilitation of Emotion, Behavior, and Attitudes. Mm-hmm. And so I figured, what the heck is this? And she said, no, we're just going to talk to him. Don't worry about it. So we go into this townhouse, this this brownstone building on 47 East 53rd Street, and we walk into the lobby, and we take a seat, and it's a, one of these uh, lobbies with a very high ceiling, and, and you could hear all the screaming, all the screaming, and they're screaming F-words, they're screaming F-U, 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 and I'm thinking, what the heck is going on here? But we sat there, and we waited for Dr. Dan Casriel, and he finally came down the steps and led us back up to his little office, and and he says, so what's the problem? And my mom described what we had just been through. And he turns around. He's, he's now talking to my mom. And and he says this. He says, um, Mrs. Russo, I need you to understand that your son is a drug addict. And part of the behavior of a drug addict is that he's also a liar. It wouldn't surprise me if he was also a thief because that's the way drug addicts are. And I said, what are you talking about? You don't even know me. And without missing a beat, he says, continues to look at my mom and says, allow me to demonstrate. And he looks at me and he says, uh, so Mitch, when's the last time you've got high? And I said, I haven't gotten high since uh, the beginning of the summer. And again, without looking over at me, continuing to look right into my mom's eyes, he says, I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> so he, <laughs> he basically pinned me on the spot. Uh, and then he went on to explain what he was doing in New York, which was pretty radical. They called it screen therapy. I don't know. Uh, it, it wasn't quite the same as primal therapy at the time, but it was called screen therapy. And the next thing that happened was odd and uh, very unexpected. Uh, basically, he had talked my mother into leaving me there without any clothes or without any, uh, anything at all. She just basically said, uh, I just spoke to the doctor, and he recommended that you stay here and get better. And I said, wait a minute. You told me you were bringing me to an appointment to see a psychiatrist or psychologist or something, and now you're telling me I'm a prisoner here in this house? And the doctor pops up and says, listen, the doors are locked. You can leave anytime you want, but your mom has committed to never letting you back home until you're done. And I look at my mom. I said, what is he talking about? And she says, yep, uh, you're not allowed to come back home. So if you leave, you're on the street and you're on your own. And, I mean, listen, I'm 16 years old and, you know, I've I've earned some money in my life, but I've never had a job where I had to support myself. Uh, I wouldn't even know where to begin. So I just figured I would, I would fake my way through this thing and get out of there as fast as I could. So I end up staying, and the first thing they have to do of course, is they have to body strip me to make sure I have no more drugs, and then they have to detox me. So what they did is they, after I body stripped and showered, they gave me some basic clothes, and I was put into a room all alone. And I was, I wouldn't say locked in that room, but I was 
in a closed door room by myself and I was told that I would be there for three days and they would be bringing me these medicinal herbal drinks to help me detox over the course of the next three, three to four days. And I said, well, what am I going to do? I have nothing to do. And, and he pointed to the bookshelf and said, well, there's plenty of books. Pick a book, uh, get comfortable and start reading. So I did, and I, I found this book. I didn't quite know what it was about, but it had a cool picture on the cover, so I picked it up, and it was uh, Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. And I sat there for the next four days, and I read all three volumes of Lord of the Rings. And it was amazing. I mean, of course, the books were amazing, and, and having to be there with nothing to do was weird. I would come out after the third day, I was starting to come out for meals and I would be brought into like a living room setting with 50 or 60 other people and everybody, it was, AJ, you can't imagine how weird it was. Uh, people were coming over and sitting next, next down to me and saying, oh, I just want you to know that we love you, that you're safe here. Uh, and, and it's like, you love me? I, what, what, who do you think you are? What do you mean? Get away from me, you weirdo. Uh, and, and so this went on for three or four days. And um, um, at that point, after the, I think it was just at the fifth day, I was allowed to become part of the general population. And uh, at that point, I was assigned a house job, which was to clean the bathrooms. And I, I didn't quite understand, but then I had to go to these scream meetings where I had to scream like everybody else. And I all this time, I'm thinking to myself, how the heck, what do I got to do to get out of this thing? This is the weirdest thing I've ever been involved in in my life. And I, I just figured I'll go along with this until I could figure out an angle and get myself out of here. Well, I sort of went along for with it for about six weeks until the main therapist for the community calls me in and he says to me, look, you cannot fake your way through this. You, excuse me, you will not get out unless you buckle down and do the work. And I mean really do the work. And at that point, I was like, all right, I guess if that's what I got to do, because it really was the only way out was the way through. So I, I buckled down, AJ, and I got to tell you, it was it was hard. I mean, I had to... I had to work on myself and I found myself crying a lot and I found myself expressing a lot of anger and we were in basically three of these groups a day, six days a week. We were not allowed out of that building for the first eight months and, and it was a very tough cycle and when I mean allowed out, yes, we could go up on the porch, uh, upstairs on the roof, or occasionally we would be taken out in a small group to do something outside the building, but that was the extent of it. And while I was there, I became very close to one particular counselor. His name was Chester. And Chester was a former addict and a former wrestler. So he was this huge, huge guy. He must have been six eight and maybe 250 pounds. Uh, and he was he was a brute of a looking guy, but he was a real pussycat sweetheart of, of a guy too. Very emotional, very sensitive, very caring. And he took care of me. He took an interest in me, took care of me. And I worked and I worked. And I was in that program, AJ, for 18 months until I finally graduated. And um, I was, uh, I graduated 18 months later and uh, it was time for me to go back to school at this point because I had missed a lot of high school. And so I was reinserted back into the community, and um, but I kept going uh, to the facility at night. In fact, part of what they call phase three was for me to go back three nights a week for more groups. And then they started involving my family and my parents and my brothers and my sisters, and we all went for these groups. Um, but I did graduate, and, and the result of me graduating was in all honesty, it's how I grew up. It's how I entered the world as an adult, having resolved a lot of the, tr the pain and trauma that I think a lot of kids 
take into their adult life. I was, so I, I think of myself as very, very lucky. I think of myself as having received a gift for having been brought through this process uh, and come out in one piece. And even to this day, almost, geez, almost 40 plus years later, I am still clean and sober. This is an amazing story. Like, I have never in my life heard of a, a program like this. Um, you know, of course, there's all these different options for, for rehab that uh, people have. And most people are uh, prevented from accessing them because they're so expensive. Uh, but it sounds like your parents were able to afford for you to be in there for 18 plus months and to continue to go back. Um and to hear you say that you haven't touched drugs in 40 plus years, that's, that's incredible. Well, let's, let's be fair about this. First of all, this program was so expensive that my parents had to mortgage the house. Ah. But they, they believed that it was worth it to save the life of their son. Wow. So you're right. It was a very expensive program. And I mean, um, there was another part to the story I, I didn't mention, but I'm going to tell you about. Okay. Remember I mentioned Chester? Sure. Well, I stayed in touch with Chester after the program, and he was always so encouraging and so friendly and so loving in so many ways. And one day I called to speak to Chester, and he wasn't available. And I, I said, okay, well, just leave a message for him and tell him that Mitch called and to please call me back. And as you remember, I mean, I'm talking about really, I mean, this is the 1970s. There's no cell phone. Uh, so I waited a few days. I didn't get a call back, so I called again. And I asked to speak to Chester, and they said, one moment. And they connected me to the head of the program. And his his name was Ron Brancata. And it's amazing that I remember these names, AJ, because I haven't even said them in all these years. Right. Uh, Ron Brancato. So I get Ron on the phone. I said, uh, hey, uh, I'm wondering what's going on. I'm trying to reach Chester. And he says, Mitch, I'm sorry to say this, but Chester died of an overdose three oh, nights ago. Oh, crap. So I, uh, I'm tearing up right now as I'm saying this because he was just such a – without him, I think I would have died. I would have never made it through the program. Oh, man, that's heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But, uh, and so, you know, since I sometimes think that in a way he sacrificed himself for me and I have in, out of respect for Chester and out of respect for myself, I would never, ever go back to drugs ever again. So I want to talk a little bit more about, uh, your family. Um, your, your mom dropped you off. She dropped you off at this, uh, the re rehab place. Uh, Ariba, I think that's what you called it. Um, right. What happened between your relationship with your mom and your dad and even your siblings as you were going through this process? Was there any kind of work done? Well, they were they were showing up individually and privately for for group counseling as well. Okay. So there were p parents groups while we were there working upstairs. The parents would work downstairs unbeknownst to us. So they could be in the building and we would never know it. Um, and so they were going through their own process uh, at the same time. And it was probably maybe two months into the program that we were allowed a phone call to get on the phone and talk to family. Hmm. What'd you talk about? Well, I mean, they, they of course want to know how I'm doing, you know, and what I'm doing and, you know, and I basically at that point, and by the way, everybody who was brought into the home, the, into the program, started out at the very beginning cleaning baseboards or toilets. But over the course of about six months, you reach your status increases as you achieve more, both emotionally and, and responsibility wise, until everyone, eventually everyone gets a chance at being the house manager. So, you know, in that first phone conversation, <clears throat> my mom said, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm not cleaning toilets anymore. <laughs> and she said, what? You're cleaning toilets? I said, no, no, I'm not doing it anymore. She goes, what do you mean anymore? They had you cleaning toilets? 
And I said, well, yeah, Mom, it's just part of the program. She goes, well, we didn't. We paying all this money, and you're cleaning their toilets? <laughs> right. You know, but, you know, what, what the program was about, it wasn't about having clean toilets. It was about teaching us to take basic responsibilities and then build on those responsibilities slowly but deliberately to learn how to take control and manage our lives. Well, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I could see why your mom w was upset about that, particularly if yeah. she hadn't been clued in by the, you know, the head of the program, exactly what your, your, your recovery would look like. Right. Uh, was there any kind of 12 step facilitation in that program? None whatsoever. This was not a 12 step program on any level. There was no element of spirituality uh, at all. So there was, um, I mean, the guidance that we had was, I thought, top notch. I mean, we, Dr. Casriel was a psychiatrist and he had a staff of doctors <clears throat> and they had, um, uh, they were videotaping many of the sessions. Uh, and so these videotapes were used for research, as we were told. Mm. Um, and so they were doing fundamental research on how to discharge human emotions and how to help people see those emotions from a perspective that they could never see uh, on their own and by themselves. Interesting. Okay. And so you're, you're a teenager going through this process. Right. Did you resist in terms of what you were willing to accept about the process as you were going along through it? Was it difficult for you to accept where you were after, let's say, maybe the first 90 days? Well, I resisted like a bastard. I, I absolutely, <laughs> you know, I, I, but I, but I, but I did is I tried to use my street smarts to resist. So I resisted in silence and I made believe I was going along with everything, thinking that I could get out of here faster if I just behaved good. Mm. But, but that didn't quite work. And I got to the point where I kept saying to myself, where would I go? What would I do if I were to leave? And then, you know, what would that do to my parents? And, you know, what, what would my life look like if I ended up having to live on the street? Now, as a corollary to this, my mom told me years later that if I ever had come knocking on the door in the middle of the night, she would have never thrown me out. She, she was just that kind of a person. And I probably would have come home and then she would have let me stay home. And I probably at some point would have gone back to drugs again. Yeah, probably true. So, so but I believed that she would. And that was all that was important. And I think that's what the doctor knew that, right? That's right. You know, um, and so getting your parents to buy into that was important uh, for yes. your, to save your life, essentially. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And from what I from what I understand about this uh, clinic, it still exists in New York. You know, uh, it doesn't surprise me that it does, uh, but I haven't been in touch with them for many many years. Huh. Yeah. Uh, it's still there, and they're still providing treatment. It's uh, it's pretty interesting that you were kind of you were there in the beginning, essentially. Yeah. Um, and it's still there all these years later. Of course, I think they've uh, renamed it, but it still exists. Um, so you did this program eighteen plus months. Did you ever do anything out after that to stay recovered? You know. There was a, I should explain the phases. So phase one was learning how to take responsibility first for yourself and then for a group of people, which is the family, quote unquote, right. and eventually responsibility for the whole house. Phase two is where you live at the facility, but you go out every single day to school or to a job. Okay. And so I got set up to get some tutoring to keep me, try and keep me up for my high school. And I got a job working at a clothing store the other half of the time. So just about every day, uh, I was leaving the facility and I was 
going to work. But uh, by the way, it's all part time. So I'd come back at two o'clock or three o'clock, and it would be another full set of uh, uh, sessions in the afternoon, and then we'd eat dinner and go back into session again. So. Um, these groups went on continuously throughout the time we were there. And, you know, later I had learned to use the groups for the purposes that they were set up for. So I would use the group to discharge my emotion and then to rationally sort through my feelings with the help of everybody in the group. And we went around one at a time, and that's how the group operated. But it was during this time that we started to get reacclimated to the outside world. and and you know, for me, um, it made me feel as if, yes, I was making progress. Yes, I could even handle the outside world. But here, here was the interesting thing, because as, as you ended phase two, we were given some interesting assignments. We were told that we needed to go out and start a relationship with a member of the opposite sex. And, uh, and that relationship would be somewhat supervised, meaning... It, most of us who were involved with drugs as, at an early age did not have healthy human sexual relationships or none at all. And this was designed to do so while we were sober and while we were still still had access to the, the, the team back at the facilities. So we went out and we found girlfriends and, and uh, we started, you know, going out in the evenings and socializing and learning how to be in a bar without having to drink and and then having to have dates and, and all those sort of things, which were very, very, very strange to me after the life I had led. I mean, so, you know, for me, it was, it was a very, very important experience. Then we finally got to phase three where we moved back home and we were coming back three nights a week for, for sessions. And... Uh, besides having some number of sessions and interviews, one of the requirements to graduate the program was basically to do three things. One was to have a successful, uh, full, longer-term relationship with a girl, a girlfriend, if you if you were heterosexual. Uh, the second thing was to have a job, and the third thing was to have a living situation which you supported on to some degree on your own. And when you had all three of those things, you were eligible to graduate. And, you know, for me, AJ, it was, it was interesting because I had all of those three things and I graduated and I felt good. I felt like I was whole again. I felt like I was healthy. I felt like I was functioning in society just like I was supposed to, but about, Six months out, I started to get this feeling, and the feeling was, is that all there is? And I started to realize or feel that if that's all there is, which is my apartment, my job, and my girlfriend, then I'm not so sure this is better than drugs. Hmm. Because it wasn't much fun, <laughs> to tell you the truth. <laughs> I, I wasn't... I had not replaced a lot of my other behavior. Now, I also wanted to mention that I was the lead guitar player in a rock band. I think I mentioned that I that we had a band. Right. But but I was, and this was, I think, a mistake. I was um, not allowed to play the guitar mm. uh, ever when I was in therapy because it was supposed to have connected me back to the drug world. So I lost the ability to play. I mean, I didn't lose my love of the guitar, but I had spent all of my youth practicing and taking lessons. And then I went out and I was too focused on having, you know, the three things I needed. And I had, and then when I went home, I found out that somebody had come into my house and stolen my electric guitar. So now I didn't even have a guitar. And I let that fade away. And for many, many years, I resented uh, the program for just acting with, in retrospect, I think was a, that was a dumb decision. I would but agree. Uh, the the thing that I wanted to tell you is that um, about six months later, when I was having these feelings of "Is that all there is?" I was um, I was going back and forth to work on the subway, and I uh, I was sitting on something I couldn't quite figure out. It was 
some kind of paper. So I pulled the paper out from under my butt, and it was a, a flyer for a, a free seminar. And it was going to be like two blocks from where I worked after work one day. And it was in 1975. And so I went to that pre-seminar, and it turned out to be a meditation-based spiritual program. And I realized pretty quickly that this was going to fill the hole in my life that I felt was missing. So there was the spiritual component Mm -hmm. to complete the picture for me. And I got involved with this program, and I loved it. And I practiced it for many, many years. And um, it benefited me enormously. And I learned how to do things on the spiritual realm, if you will, that, that to this day still serve me well. Yeah, I my hope is that the, the program has adopted a spiritual component because that's what saved my life. I mean, I could walk into a room and sit in the room uh, for hours on end talking about the addiction and working through some the recovery process, but without the belief of spiritual guidance and support and love, um, I'd still be addicted and, and using. Yeah. Um, so that's so important. You know... The, the truth is, um, you know, we don't always know what it what we need uh, when we're young. And so, you know, I think that I hope that you have some gratitude for your parents for making that decision for you, whereas some parents just don't. And, you know, they're more focused on themselves. At least that was my experience. Um, but it sounds like your parents, uh, they, they put you first and that's, uh, that's beautiful. Yes. Yes. I had a lot and I, I, to this day, I've had a lot of appreciation for what my parents had done for me. And, and I, uh, I credit them with saving my life, just like I said. And, and my mom and I have been very, 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 very close all of our lives uh, my dad and I, you know, we have a good relationship, but never as close as my mom and I. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, uh, as I got older, um, there was still, you know, here's the thing about addiction, and it's it's something that happens to us, and we fall prey to, and it changes us in unseen ways, DJ, and even after I was sober, even though I had pretty much completely refrained from from all forms of, of drugs and alcohol, I still would occasionally have a glass of wine, but I never truly enjoyed alcohol anyway. Um, but I ended up meeting a beautiful woman who I fell in love with, and I married her. And it wasn't until literally a few weeks before the big day, before we were to be married, that I discovered that she was a very, very sick alcoholic. Uh. And I had discovered that by accident. I found 35 empty rum bottles under the guest bedroom. Oh, goodness. Under the bed. And I confronted her on it, and she tried to lie her way out of it and then make a mistake. And and I had to do some soul-searching and say, do I still want to marry her? And what came into my mind was, well, listen, my family has been waiting for me to find a woman and get married, and and everybody is coming in from all over the country, and we had just paid for the caterer and the band and all this Mm -hmm. other stuff. And and I decided to go through with it. Uh, And the other part of this, and this is why I wanted to relate this part of the story, is because I must have subconsciously attracted her to me. And uh, on top of that... um, there was a part of me, I think, that I later discovered that maybe didn't believe that I deserved anything but that. Mm-hmm. And we we got married, and the marriage be- became um, very, very difficult very quickly because the drinking now was really in the forefront for me. And, and I did my best to try and stop her, which if we now we all know you know, uh, trying to stop an alcoholic from drinking is not only not my job, but not even possible. Mm-hmm. So we we had a child and she grew up healthy and there was a period of time where she didn't drink, which is when she got pregnant and, and gave birth. And, and then later she went back to drinking and it got worse and it got worse. And we stuck together 
I stuck with her for 14 years, but I, I, I had the help of the Al-Anon organization. And I got involved with Al-Anon because I was literally at my wit's end. I had paid for 11 treatment programs for her. And remember now, I had done what I later was told was practically impossible. I had kicked heroin addiction and stayed clean all my life. So my thinking was, well, shit, if I could do it, why can't she? Right. And and not only that, but I'm strong enough for both of us, so I'll get her through too. <laughs> both <laughs> completely naive viewpoints. And um, neither one of them came to pass. Uh, eventually, um, she had degraded to the point where I would come home and she'd be passed out in a, in a pool of vomit on the kitchen floor. Uh, later informed me that she had been sleeping with other men and had opened up secret credit card accounts and had run up $130,000 in bills. And Good I got grief. to the point where just to save myself and my child that we basically had to divorce. Uh, and so I divorced, divorced her after 14 years of marriage. And, um, and, you know, that was a very, very, very difficult period in my life. And I got to tell you, my, my, the spiritual side of my life is what held me together. And my Al-Anon friends and the group that I went through was wonderful. And that's how I got through all of this. Wow. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate Al-Anon. That was the first meeting I ever went to was an Al-Anon meeting. So I understand how uh, transformative it can be. Well, Mitch, before we close, I want to I want to talk briefly about your business. Now, you've yeah. been you've were voted best entrepreneur. You've been president, CEO. You're an author. Do you contribute? Do you attribute your success in the recovery program or uh, to your success as a business owner, or is there more to it? Well, I'd say it's a part of it. Okay. I mean, it, to be fair, as I mentioned. You know, I grew up at the age of, you know, late 18 years old when I graduated that program. I actually was an emotional adult and or as close to one as one can get uh, after 18 months of the intensity of the work that I had put in. And that cleared the debris that allowed me to stay focused on my goals and you know, one of the goals that my sister and I set without ever talking to each other and completely in secret was that we never want to be dependent on another person for mm-hmm. money. We watched as my mother, as my dad left and my mother struggled because she couldn't get anything but a menial job and she had to put up with abusive men in an office situation and and horrible, horrible stuff. And so she became... A uh, an attorney who is now works uh, at the, su- the Supreme Court of the state of New York, and I became a business owner. I started a business, and and I just knew that I had to do this to to survive. And then I found out I loved it, <laughs> and then I found out that I was actually pretty good at it, and it became a passion of mine. But I don't think I could have done it if I had not completed the program. I think if I would have left and lived on the street, I probably would not have lived past the age of 18. Mm. So it's hard to say that the program didn't have an effect on my professional life, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, can you tell our audience where they can find you online and, you know, where to get your book and your website and such? Sure, sure. The the best thing is, is, um, you know, if, if somebody's listening and they do have a business you can go to Mitch Russo, M-I-T-C-H-R-U-S-S-O dot com. And on that website, I have 50 different business building articles on my blog. I run a very, very exciting podcast where I interview other business owners and extract their wisdom and get them to spill the beans on what makes them successful. Hmm. And I work individually with private clients from from. Uh, some of the greatest companies in the world, some of the smartest people in the world that I'm privileged enough to have as my clients. And I've worked with Tony Robbins uh, and uh, Tony, myself, and another gentleman named Chet Holmes. We built a company together called Business Breakthroughs International. So I've had a lot of fun. I've had a lot of success and a, 
and I've been gifted with the ability to help others in the, in as many ways as I possibly can. And that's what I love doing. Beautiful. I, you know, I'm a business owner myself and, you know, it's the work that I do is the best work I've ever done. And so I'm grateful to have the opportunity to kind of expand on that business by doing uh, this podcast and my other podcast journey on uh, because I get to meet people all over the world and hear their stories and help them tell their stories. So I, I truly appreciate you taking the time uh, today, Mitch, for coming on uh, and talking with us. And I am grateful to you for sharing your story. Uh, it's it's an amazing story. Um, you know, I was just surprisingly silent through most of what you were saying because I was just in awe that this actually happened for you. But uh, it sounds like it was life changing. So thank you for sharing it. My pleasure, AJ, and I, and I hope the reason I shared it today is I hope that it gives hope to those people who are still in the struggle themselves. That's really the main purpose for me in, in bringing it to light today with you. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, guys, check out Mitch's website and um, tune in next week for another exciting episode of Making an Addict. Thank you for joining the discussion today on Making an Addict. In closing, I want you to understand that there are various opinions about addiction and what makes someone an addict. The opinions expressed here on today's show are those of the person who made them. I suggest you take what you heard, process it, and decide for yourselves what you believe in. If you have feedback or want to tell your story on the show, let me know by emailing makinganaddict at gmail.com or you can reach me on social media. Again, I'm on Facebook and Twitter at DJBurr1022 and TheDJBurr on Instagram. Lastly, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be of service. Recovery saved my life, and I will be forever grateful. I will keep giving back every opportunity I am given. Tune in next time to witness our ongoing discussion on Making an Addict. Making an Addict is produced by the Recovery Legacy Network, bringing you recovery on all fronts. Learn more at recoverylegacynetwork.com. Today's show featured music by CDK.